I didn't anticipate people wanting to see a power supply video. Well, I got like 20% of comments asking for it, which is more than I expected. So buckle up in this journey to the core of insanity. Consider leaving subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Not gonna nag about notification bell, cause I hate notification just as much as you do. This time I wanna try something different, with a little less broomstick near the spine, if you catch my drift. Let me know if you like this style better or not. The amount of raw information here could make it boring as watching paint dry. There's a reason why designing your own power supply is a bad idea. Wish I didn't have to learn that the hard way. If I knew it would be such a gigantic pain in the ass, I would just redesign the whole ESC to fit a bigger power supply. But no, in my infinite wisdom I thought a tiny 25x25mm 25 25 square would be enough for 200V DC-DC. Digital electronics either work or not, while analog ones can somewhat work, almost work, probably work, nearly work, work in specific scenarios, not work at all, or fully work. Let's rewind a bit to the beginning, when I first started thinking about the power supply. I did what any self-respecting engineer would do, so I googled ready-to-use solutions to avoid dealing with the PSU. I searched for power brick schematics and even asked people if they had something tested. No mistakes made up to this point. I mean, why reinvent the wheel when you can just copy someone else's homework, right? Well. The problem began when I realized I had to fit a 22-inch SUV tire onto Honda Civic. Doable, but requires a lot of mental and physical gymnastics. Power bricks were out of the question because they were maybe one from XP Power that even remotely meet my needs, which is 32 to 200 volts, down to 12 volts, and 1 amp. And of course, it was still too big and too expensive. Just my luck. Then I tried to search for an IC chip that could potentially handle high voltage. Lo and behold, I stumbled upon LT8316, which seems like a perfect fit. It even had a reference design with exact part numbers in a datasheet. Ideal for my application. There was just a tiny, tiny problem. It used a gigantic transformer. But hey, I decided to build it anyways just to see if I could salvage it in case I found a smaller one. Spoiler alert, never found a smaller one. Or maybe I'm just bad at searching. I kept experimenting it in LT Spice and overall it was pretty good. I wish someone smarter and more knowledgeable about analog stuff could take a look and maybe lend a hand, but... It was already eating up a buttload of time, so I threw in a towel and moved on. The third option was a recommendation from VESC people, but electronics nightmare. A DC-DC with so-called floating ground. I have no idea if it has a proper name, but that's what I'm calling it. It's a pure debugging nightmare and insanity rolled into one. A PWM controller that operates in suspense with an imaginary ground lever somewhere between VIN and real ground. I honestly have no clue how it works, but it came straight from Texas Instruments and well, it works. I built two versions of it. You can probably tell, since I'm not using it, that it had some issues. Namely, the output voltage was unstable to the point I had no clue what I was looking at. It varied between 11 to 17 volts depending on input voltage, temperature, load, rotation of the earth, its mood, and God only knows what else. It was probably a massive skill issue on my end and perhaps the fact that I tried to extend its capabilities to 200 volt without knowing what I was doing. While the original application note mentions something about 150 volts. I spent an untold amount of hours trying to make it work but failed in the end. At least two months wasted swapping around components, measuring, simulating and beating myself with a stick. I know for a fact that this design does work and would probably work for me too since I'm not really using 12V anywhere in my ESC. But I just couldn't let it go. 
my mild OCD didn't let me. The fourth option was a classic DC-DC converter based on TL494 with a MOSFET driver suggested to me by one of the Electronic Engineering Discord member. Not gonna name him, but thanks dude, it saved my butt big time. First of all, it was a pleasant and sane alternative to previous madness. Everything had a real, proper, common ground. It was a design I could actually understand. Well, maybe not fully, but anyone who can truly understand this DC converter is a real wizard. I'm gonna dive deeper into this, so maybe some of you will get the gist of it. Whole schematic consists of four blocks. Startup circuit, which produces 11 volts, allowing a whole converter to start up, then turns itself off once the output voltage reaches 12 volt. Converter on TL494 with copious amounts of discrete component that sets up parameters like soft start, maximum dead time, operating frequency and whatnot. MOSFET driver that translates TL494 output to something that transistor can work with. With a gate clamp made with PNP transistor just to make sure the main MOSFET does not turn on with the transient voltage. Long story short, if you apply high voltage really fast to MOSFET, it can turn itself on if you do not strongly clamp the gate to the ground. MOSFET, diode, capacitors and inductor that does the actual heavy lifting, also known as hot loop. Sounds complex? Nah, it's pretty easy to understand once you get to know these friends a little better. The startup circuit is the only place where a bit of magic happens. The magic ingredient here is the CPC 3980NFET, which works in depletion mode. That means it's normally on, conducting without needing to open the gate. It produces around 11 volt, albeit inefficiently, from anywhere between 16 to 500 volts. Once the 12 volt appears on a startup node, Q2 gets shut down. Circuit knows when to leave the stage and let the big boys handle the rest. I had two problems with this circuit. First one, that I initially used a different transistor, the BSS126, which was a lot weaker and produced a lot more heat due to its much higher RDS on. What can I say? My dumb ass didn't realize that a puny 21 milliamp wouldn't be enough to fire up the MOSFET driver. I killed like 4 of them before swapping to GigaChat transistor that's 5 times stronger and has 15 times lower RDS on. Now it works like a charm. Now the main star of the show is the TL494. An old but gold design of a manual PWM controller. People have built a lot of stuff with it since it's pretty damn configurable. I didn't know exactly when this IC was first introduced, but a quick Google search shows it was in 1977, which makes it a dinosaur in the electronics world. It has two outputs of BGT transistors, collector 1, collector 2, emitter 1 and emitter 2, which are driven by op-amp inputs 1 in and 2 in. It's pretty easy to understand how it works from this functional block diagram. RT and CT pins are used to set the operating frequency. I have mine at around 200 kHz. Yeah, I know it's pretty slow compared to the modern stuff that works in the megahertz range, but hey, it works. The ref pin is a 5V regulated output which I'm using for two things. First, the easy one. Setting the dead time control to a maximum of 48%, along with C20 which makes it a soft start. The second use is to setting the first negative op-amp input to 2.5 volts. This is how the controller knows what voltage to regulate the output to. This voltage divider produces 2.5 volts from 12 volt on the VFB node. The second error op-amp is unused but can be used to implement for example overcurrent protection. Feedback is the output of both error amplifiers which has a little RC circuit feeding back to the negative op-amp input. There were a lot of calculations involved in the circuit, which I frankly don't remember anymore, 
But I do have a simulation file somewhere on my disk as a proof I didn't just pull those values out of my ass. As for the problems, not much. The only changes I made was to add a soft start and C21 which helped reduce the initial voltage overshoot. MOSFET driver part was particularly hard to debug. Sometimes this little shit just wouldn't work and I had no clue back then what was going on. It was receiving a proper signal from the PWM controller but remained quiet on its output. Later I discovered it was actually caused by the startup circuit, but by then I had already put some serious work hours. Initially I used the IRS21271, a fairly weak single-sided driver that could only handle about 200 milliamps on its output. I swapped it out for IR2181, a half bridge driver. Honestly, I have no idea if it made a difference, but it's here to stay. PNP strong clamp is as basic as it gets. I will put a link in the description of this Toshiba application node on MOSFET self turn on phenomenon. Hot loop underwent one major change beefing up transistor and diode. Biggest problem of this DC DC converter was that applying a sudden high voltage, for example 190 volt, killed the MOSFET and the diode. It was fine when starting with like 100 volt and raising it to 190 volt, which could have been caused by numerous things. I was much dumber back then, so I was grasping at straws trying to figure it out. From some thermal camera footage, I saw the diode flare up followed by the MOSFET so I figured the stronger components might just solve the problem. Then I slapped in a bigger and fed in a diode and again, hard to say if it did the trick, but at least it didn't make things much worse. On the output pretty much nothing changed, except I used the 16 volt Zener instead of 13 volt one, because I couldn't fully eliminate the initial overshoot. At least now it won't toast the Zener if that happens. Once the 12 volt reaches the desired level, the D6 backfits it to the startup node, disabling the startup circuit. D4 is just an LED indicating that DC DC converter is fully operational. You probably also notice the array of output capacitors made from MLCC caps, with no electrolytic capacitors inside. You see, when buying a low ESR electrolytic cap, you never really know what you're getting. I tried three different types and they all sucked. The output ripple was horrendous. Even the cheapest, crappiest MLCC caps have an order of magnitude lower series resistance. When I swapped them in one of the prototypes, the ripple immediately improved to around 20 to 40 millivolt peak to peak. That's the entire DC DC converter I'm currently using in my ESC. It has no problem starting up even from 190 volt and besides MOSFET getting a little hot, it works for an extended period of time. Finally, a solution that works. It took a lot of blood, sweat and tears, especially tears, to get to this point. I have also tried a digital DC-DC converter using STM microcontroller, which has a lot of potential, but it's infinitely more complex and I figured it would take me a lot more time to get it up and running. Since it's an insane mix of digital and analog circuitry. And the 6 one is based on AP64200 and a PFET transistor. While I did make the PCB, I never managed to get it working though. Anyways, you asked for a power supply deep dive video, here it is. I strongly recommend not trying this madness yourself. But if you already have an experience with analog design, I always welcome some advice. That's it for today's video, hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.